This video is a brief overview of this hour-long documentary, which is well worth watching as well. Karen from Valve took reference pictures from the deserts beyond this mountain range and drove eight hours to Columbia Gorge to get these images for Half-Life 1, which is up near Seattle, despite Black Mesa being based in New Mexico. Mike Harrington previously worked for Microsoft but disliked working for large companies, gave them a year's notice, then left to make his own games, and Gabe was like, I want to do that as well, and so they set up Valve. They didn't expect it to succeed, but Gabe believed they knew a fair bit about software development and how to design a company, and they shaped their company, Valve, at the same time as they developed their first game, Half-Life. Mike knew Michael Abrash, who was working at id at the time. They visited, learned a thing or two about game development, and walked away with the source code for the Quake engine, which they used for Half-Life, and greatly modified over the course of the game's development. Gabe had just read Stephen King's The Mist, and they didn't want to make that as a game, but were inspired by its tension and atmosphere. And with that, Valve started on two games, Prospero and then Quiver in late 1996. Jay helped work on a character with magic beam effects, which the Quiver team saw and stole. Quiver stole all of Prospero's ideas and quickly became the most interesting of the two, eventually becoming Half-Life. At the time, 90% of video games were unprofitable, and a few percent were majorly successful, with the key value being talent. So Valve started hiring level designers with past game experience, then began discovering modders. Of the team that worked on Half-Life, very few people had previously done game development professionally. Most were enthusiasts who dabbled in their spare time. Many were around the age of 20, and who had previously worked in very different industries, like working as an IP lawyer or as a Waffle House manager. The challenge was in finding these people and in convincing them that their time was better spent working for Valve. They found a way of using the Quake Engine save system to join levels together in a seamless manner, with nothing between the levels but a short load sequence. The two cutting-edge technologies they really invested in was 16-bit colour, because smooth colour gradients was artistically very freeing, and the other technology was skeletal animations which allowed them to greatly build on the number and complexity of the character animations. This gave them the freedom to dabble, to mix and match, and to structure elaborate sequences where characters jumped into and out of scripted states. It was challenging to get their work seen when the player was often sprinting past it at about 25 miles an hour, often looking the other way and immediately shooting everything on sight. The animations were made with the idea they'd be seen from behind glass, but when the level designers got hold of it, they loved putting them in places that the player could reach and to mess about with. We take these kinds of scripted scenes for granted now, but back then it was new for games, and is what made the experience Half-Life. Gabe talks about how fun is more important than realism, but how do you define fun? They decided on it being the degrees of which the game recognises and responds to the player's choices and actions, and using that definition helped with design decisions, with something happening every three to five seconds of the player progressing forward in order to acknowledge the player's existence. This meant interesting things to look at, animated sequences, a sound playing, or having something new to shoot at. And adding small things like decals on walls when shot, or to have enemies run away when attacked, helped sell this connectivity the player had with the world. Character design. Chuck came from working on Duke Nukem and created shiny armor-clad aliens and the scientists. Ted preferred genital and aquarium-style monsters, and also did the soldiers. They had a hard time getting these two vastly different creature styles to work, but it resulted in cool crossovers like the zombie where Chuck got one of Ted's headcrab designs and put them on one of his scientists. This model of a NASA space suit eventually became the HEV suit, but they didn't want a space marine soldier type to be the protagonist. Ivan the Space Biker is mentioned, who Chuck worked on, explaining the making of the early low-poly prototype design and how screenshots can end up being seen where you didn't intend for them to be. He asked Mike what Gordon should look like and was told to put himself in there. And there he is, complete with ponytail. Chuck also designed G-Man, who was inspired by the Cigarette Man from the X-Files. He initially only showed up in this early scene, but later in the day they made him the big baddie and he was scattered around the places where he could be seen but not reached. During development, they decided that headcrabs didn't provide enough enemy variety for the early stages, so they also designed the Vortigaunts. And since they were fun and looked cool, they were sprinkled across the game, and even earlier in the playthrough than initially intended. The Assassin was made late in development, and in just a week and a half. Ken had to work with what he had, by combining a model from somewhere with AI from somewhere else. He built just a crude level for it, but it became a memorable part of the finished game. Hound Eye worked well, but Chuck made a bigger, tougher one called the Panther Eye, which sounded great on paper, but they never found a place where it fitted the game. The Stookabout was another creature that was eventually cut, and the Chub Toad was bait for other monsters to be distracted by. But again, time and pressures meant that this got cut as well. Karen single-handedly textured the bulk of the game. She grew up outside of DC, where there were lots of banal office buildings, which became the concept for the Black Mesa facility. At some point, she shifted from hand-painted to photo-reference, which she says you can notice because they're much, much better. In November 1997, the game was about three months away from release, but it wasn't fun. 
everybody had gone off and done their own thing and the game felt disjointed. Lots of cool things were half finished and everybody had done their own thing, which could have stemmed from their mod developer roots. The turning point came when everybody got together in a room and Gabe played through everyone's levels for two days straight. At one point grabbing his hair and saying, fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail. <laughs> Sierra, the publisher for the game, had a timeline for them to follow and Valve said they knew they wouldn't be paid for any extra work they did, but that they'd do it anyway. Because, as Gabe says, Late is just for a little while, suck is forever, right? And they wanted to invest the extra work because they didn't want Valve to be that other kind of company. So Valve created a small cabal of people from every profession and wrote up a plan for every level, starting from the beginning, using Mark's story and the sketches as inspiration. They wanted for gameplay, time-wise, to contain a certain percentage for exploring, a certain percentage for fighting, and a certain percentage for puzzle solving, which was applied throughout the game, and they think it worked well. Opening levels. There was an expectation for games at the time where you just jump straight in the action, and Half-Life didn't want to do this, so did a lengthy train intro instead. A cinematic experience, rather than to just be a shooter like other games were. The pre-disaster bits of the game were mostly salvaged from earlier versions, with just quick and easy changes made to them. The Sector C control rooms were NASA inspired, and coloured stripes were added to help lost players. Some people at Valve were challenged with kitchen appliances, and there was a fire at one point which inspired the exploding microwave incident. Valve added a lot of mundane early stuff to the game, and intentionally so. The ill-fated chamber sequence, which they refer to as the submarine room, had already been made, but they didn't know what it could do. They constructed the whole out-of-world sequence in a single day, and after this it really set the stage for what the game would be, where you're Gordon Freeman living through it in an immersive, unbroken fashion. One of the funding methods was to sell a preview copy of the game to a graphics card company. Mike said how great a milestone that was to finally deliver it, but then that three-level demo leaked, and he was so frustrated that that had happened. However, it took off. People loved playing it, magazines reviewed it, and hype for the game built. And all this positive, outsider feedback gave the team tremendous confidence in what they were doing. Previous video games had the vowels of weapon design, where they'd have a shotgun and a pistol and a melee weapon of some sort, and there would be the drive to get a better weapon. But for Half-Life, they tried to give each weapon a purpose of some kind. Gabe liked snarks and watching people run away from them. The biting animation was inspired by Chuck's cat. The Hornet gun was designed for an alien enemy. Chuck says that was his biggest thrill. Brainstorming ideas with the crew, implementing them, playing with them, and discovering that they're fun. They wanted a melee weapon that was fun to smack the world with. Using a crowbar made sense, and Gabe said it felt profoundly satisfying to smack walls. All of the sound effects, music, reverb effects, and some of the levels were created by one person, Kelly Bailey. He stated that having sound inform you of what's about to happen is very powerful because AI is often hidden, so they used sounds to train players to, possibly subconsciously, know what was about to happen. As an example, soldiers communicate their state and intent vocally in a way that the player can hear. He hadn't written a soundtrack before this, but he wrote one for Half-Life and it won an award. Kelly knew the sound engine extremely well, and enough about level design to hook sounds in and to connect everything together. For the enemies, he modified animal sounds. Headcrabs used rat sounds that were slowed down and reversed. Reverb greatly added to the atmosphere, and helped make cavernous spaces feel believable. When it came to getting characters to talk, every member of staff seemed to think it was difficult apart from the one aspect of it that they knew how to do, and the moment they realised this they worked together and within about an hour they had done it. When it came to NPCs talking to one another, Valve added small question-answer conversations between scientists, which may not always make sense, but it felt like they had personality. I am rather looking forward to this analysis, aren't you? I don't think so. They then got them to look at the player and to communicate with them. Early on this led to an amusing encounter, but this elevator was falling, and as it passed one of the scientists inside said Hello Gordon Freeman! before exploding far below in a shower of jibs. After the cabal was formed, they worked on stitching all of the levels together. Some needed creating almost from scratch, like surface tension. Other bits, like the ethics lab, had to be almost completely redone. Meanwhile other parts, like Power Up, had already been made and remained virtually untouched primarily because it had been designed specifically for a certain type of creature who they decided to keep. The design of a level starts at the end, figuring out how to block the player from completing it straight away and then working back from there, and Power Up is used as an example of this. Before the Cabal, the levels were made and AI was placed in them to perform, but after the Cabal, the levels were made around the AI to better complement their playstyle and strengths. For the Grunts, for instance, they borrowed heavily from the test areas for these AI starting the player and grunts at varying heights relative to one another because it was fun to see them running around and attempting to flank the player. They dropped nodes around the levels to tell the AI how best to hide, to move, and so on. Nodes in the air were added for the Zen sequences with their flying creatures. 
They wanted to use the train technology since it was a vehicle the player could use but was limited in where it could go. Some players didn't use the train so they electrified the rails as an incentive to get them to bring the train with them. They wanted this part of the game to reveal some of the deep and hidden parts of Black Mesa and to contain some of the more exotic enemies too, though sadly most of these were removed due to time pressures. They tried to make this area feel less linear with branches in the track and stuff. Kelly sketched out an extensive bit of the game featuring a cliff, outdoor bases, deserts and a dam, and this motivated the rest of the team to start building all of it. They loved the cliffside bit and felt it played really heavily on the feeling of vertigo, and loved how it messed with previously predictable game mechanics like trying to avoid a thrown grenade. Karen discovered that every time she made a new texture people would be all like, oh cool new textures, let's use it in whichever level I'm currently developing, which could cause chaos so she ended up naming all these textures for the bits of the game they were for, which seemed to work. Later on, alien jump pads were introduced to remind the player that they were nearing the alien part of the game. These were initially just a visual infection, but they were made into working jump pads by John, who discovered Harry's easter egg picture of his daughter inside a destroyed office somewhere, and moved it into Gordon's locker near the start of the game instead. Some things people have speculated about for 25 years were made by Mark in about 5 minutes. For instance, near the start of the game, Karen put a dot on the world map texture. Mark saw that and called that dot Black Mesa. He likes evocative names because it means people write the story for you so you don't have to. He simply creates the mysteries and raises the questions. A lot of the scripted sequences come in later to flesh out the story, like the soldiers being there to kill everybody. They kept the story inside the game, but sometimes it needed a stronger hint, which was given by character dialogue to more concretely describe to the player where they needed to go, or what was happening, and so on. Casting scientists' voices wasn't working well until Hal was considered. They got him on the phone and the crew immediately agreed that he was perfect for the role. Mike Shapiro did Barney and the G-Man's voices. They got G-Man's lines done normally, just for insurance, but then got Mike to do a weirder take and he did this crazy lizard voice which everybody loved. And Bill voiced the Nile Anth. The last year of development had been busy, but the crunch really picked up in those last few months and different team members dealt with it differently, telling their own stories of how some of them had families to return to, while others didn't and just worked on it until the early hours. It's worth watching them all tell their own stories at this timestamp in the main video. Zen. They wanted something really alien, and not just Earth but a bit alien for these end levels. It was initially written as being a giant organism filled with alien architecture, but was scaled back to being more corridory. Zen was one of the last bits of the game to be fleshed out, going through many iterations, with low gravity being added extremely late in development. Lots of bits were almost scrapped, but people on the team liked them too much, and the art concepts were so cool. The textures were inspired by electron microscope imagery and insects. This was all very ambitious given the limited polygon budget and the awkward boxy world editor they had to use. Being another dimension was cool and all, but what people really liked about the game were the interactions with companions, scientists and with Barney, which Zen kind of lacked. This part of the game suffered from time pressures and they're not sure it fully succeeded in being fun. Oh well, Zen was what it was, it concluded Half-Life 1 and if players don't like it then Half-Life 2 could perhaps win them back. Post release. To celebrate the release, most of Valve went on holiday to Mexico, and some of the team shares their feelings and stories about it, and the creation of Half-Life as a whole in this chapter of the video. The general sentiment being that Half-Life's development was a bunch of talented, enthusiastic people all working together in a meaningful way to create and to shape something, and they had a good time. It seemed to be a good idea to make two games worth of stuff, then to throw away the bad half, which fortunately Valve was in a position, financially, to do with Half-Life. Gabe says he doesn't look back. All the things they've done are just stepping stones to the future.